بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Good afternoon everybody uh, As you know our topic today is uh, as you see is congenital glaucoma which I'm supposed to give it in two hours as you see in your schedules in your schedule for subspeciality uh, today and next week but unfortunately the education center cut uh, one of the subspeciality lectures because uh, of the visiting professor and I can understand the uh, the situation. So I made my uh, effort to make it uh, in one hour today. You know, congenital glaucoma, if you look at it worldwide, it's a rare disease. But when you will, in certain nations, it is really uh, uh, represent a public health problem, especially in certain nations like ours here in Arab countries, in uh, India, and so on. So. Uh, what we will do today is to uh, go briefly over the definition of epidemiology, a uh, little bit on genetics, classification, and then we'll spend most of the time on how do we evaluate uh, 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 a case or a patient with congenital glaucoma, clinical features, ex evaluation, management, prognosis, and then we'll uh, give a summary for that. So. What is the congenital glaucoma? Clinically de de defined as a defective development in and around the angle of the anterior chamber, which leads to defective in the aqueous humor flow, or in another word, decrease or eliminate the outflow facility of aqueous humor. This will lead to or lead to elevation of the intracal pressure and which will give the pathological changes that we see it clinically as bophthalmos, as megalocornea, corneal haze, uh, uh, myopia, optic uh, cubbing, and so on. So this is the clinical definition for all congenital glaucomas, whether primary or secondary. Again, the congenital glaucoma classified into a primary, which is present at birth or after birth, 80% of cases recognized in the first year of life. Some of them may recognize later in infancy or early childhood. Then the secondary congenital glaucomas, which those cases that occurs as a sequelae or a combination of a, a systemic or ocular disorders or, or syndromes. So this is the broad classification. Then again, we classify the primary angle, primary, angle, primary congenital glaucoma in three categories. Why we do this? This is important for counseling with the patient or parents, as well as regarding the prognosis, into primary newborn or called neonatal congenital glaucoma. It is the most severe type. Unfortunately, most of our cases here in Saudi Arabia is uh, 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 um, uh, within this type of disease. A clinically present between birth and one month of age. Then it comes the, and carries the worst prognosis, unfortunately, this type of uh, congenital glaucoma. Then it comes the primary infantile glaucoma which occurs or recognized between the first month and 24 months of age and carries the best uh, prognosis regarding the uh, uh, surgical outcome. Then it comes the primary congenital glaucoma, which is diagnosed after the age of two or three. There is many uh, asp uh, or opinions in, reg in regard to this uh, uh, issue. So Secondary glaucoma are those conditions that are associated or the sequelae of ocular or systemic uh, uh, disease or disorder include anurea, for example, anterior segment dysgenesis like Peter's anomaly, Rigor's, axiom field, and so on, phacomatosis on top of them, stage over syndrome, neurofibromatosis, Lewis syndrome, etc. So this is a very uh, uh, an important point that three years used of age, three years of age is used generally to divide or a division between the infantile and juvenile types of glaucoma. Why is that? Because within, after the age of uh, uh, this age, after three years, the cornea no longer expands in response to the levit intracorporeal pressure, but this clearer may does up to the age of 10 years. For this reason, we 
following the patient with axial length and so on is important. So, and this is again the reason why we see axial myopia in patients with congenital glaucoma. Juvenile glaucoma doesn't have, for this reason, which is diagnosed, we said that, or, or def defined as after three years where there is no further enlargement of the cornea, uh, have no corneal enlargement or have stria. This is very important. The prevalence of the disease, when we looked at the disease, as I said earlier, it is very rare worldwide. The uh, prevalence about one in 10,000 to 20,000 in Western countries. It is a rare, rare disease. The, the pharmacologist may see one every 15 years or so. While in our area, it's, an estimated, it's estimated to be more frequent. It is well known that it's about 10 times more than Western population, about one in 2,500 live births. So, and the most common or the prevalence is mostly in patient or in Slovakian population or what is, we call them gypsies. It is one in 1,000. Uh, uh, one in 1,250, and this is probably related to the high rate of consanguinity among these nations. Tabara and others found that the primary congenital glaucoma, or in congenital glaucoma in general, is the most common cause of visual dis disturbances and blindness in, ch in children. So congenital glaucoma is the most common cause of visual impairment and blindness in children. This is very important. So we need to really look at this uh, uh, matter uh, in a more approximately and then more uh, 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 serious uh, way. From the genetic basis, again, and this is why the cases in, in Western is more or less, uh, 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 less uh, the severity of the disease is less in, in Western countries. It is, uh, 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 most of them occurrence is sporadic and mostly in, 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 in mild and moderate cases, although they have some difficult cases. In Saudi Arabia here, and many reports say that uh, uh, it is uh, an autosomal recessive, and the gene responsible for that is the sib one b one uh, among, uh, through the different uh, uh, reports from uh, Bomero, from others that reach the uh, mutation in this gene, reach up to 96% of cases. LTBB2 hasn't been reported as far as I know here, but it's being reported uh, somewhere else. So it is an autosomal uh, recessive in our area, and the gene responsible for that are among the genes that discovered up to now is sib one b one and the, the, the uh, being autosomal, rec autosomal recessive, the disease is more severe in our uh, population in, and in population with this type of inheritance. What is the pathomechanism or pathophysiology of the disease? It is not exactly known up to now. However, many pathologists, they said that there is abnormal thickening of the trabecular beams and absent of the intertrabecular space, especially in deeper layers in the juxtacanalicular meshwork. And this probably, I need you to remember this when we go or when we come to the uh, uh, surgical intervention in these cases, uh, it's very important, it is logic to say, to I believe that this is really what is going on in the uh, bath physiology of the disease. Again, presence of amorphous material, sorry, amorphous material in the subepithelial region of the Schlems Canal, which they are talking about the juxtacarecular layer of the uh, trabecular meshwork. Again, uh, one of the major uh, or prominent, I forget its name, the uh, uh, pathologist, they, they, he studied 30 cases in state, 30 cases of newborn type. Uh, uh, and he found that in all of them, there is partial or complete absence of the Schlems canal. And I feel this is the most uh, uh, thing that I, I believe uh, what's going on in a newborn type. And this is why the disease is resist, resistant to treatment or conventional way of surgical treatment as well as the severity of the disease. Again, and when you look uh, in, the, uh, in the textbook, you find that one of the battle mechanisms uh, that presents of what is called Barkan's membrane. Barkan's membrane, this is in the late 40s or mid 40s of the last century. He 
uh, based on this, he invented the goniotomy uh, as, a, as a, 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 a solution for this problem. He said that there is an imperforated membrane covering the uh, uh, trabecular meshwork, preventing the aqua humor from going through the trabecular meshwork. However, this hasn't been proven histologically up to now or even with electron microscopy. So we can say that there is nothing called Barkaz membrane. Yes, it is in the history, but up to now, nobody could have proven that there is a membrane or imperforated membrane in front of the Schlems Canal, uh, in front of the Trabeca Meshwok, preventing the aqua humor from passing to the Schlems Canal. This is very important. When we come to the symptoms and signs, whether primary or secondary, most of the time, or there is a triad, which is the epiphora, photophobia, bleporospasm. However, you need to put in mind what are the other causes that can cause a bufora, photophobia, and the bufora is bad, like bottom body, conjunctive body, lacrimal sac obstruction, as we will see in different diagnoses later on. And the signs, it's very clear. Most of the time, there is no problem with the diagnosis of conjunctive glaucoma, whether primary or secondary. It is easy to diagnose it, especially when you look to the full-blown picture of uh, 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 conjunctive glaucoma, like bophthalmus, legalocornea, corneal halo scarring, abstray and uh, optic nerve cupping if the view is allowing you to see the uh, disc, as well as the elevated intercom pressure. However, you need to keep in mind what things that may mimic, the, as you will see, the congenital glaucoma based on these uh, signs. This is different diagnosis. There is an article written by uh, our colleague, Arif Khan. It is the most beautiful one, to be honest with you, to read it. It is very important. He really uh, uh, explained or uh, uh, elaborated on the conditions that may mimic or mistaken as a congenital glaucoma. And we know <coughs> there are cases that has been operated or diagnosed as a congenital glaucoma and operated appeared later that they are not a congenital glaucoma. Worldwide, and even here in our country also. So you need to put in mind or to be aware about the conditions that can mimic or be mistaken as a congenital glaucoma. For example, large globe, pophthalmus. This can be patient with axial myopia, patient with retrobulbar mass, blue sclera. All these patients can or give or give a hint that they are a, 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 a pophthalmus and may be mistaken as a congenital glaucoma. But when you look to the other findings, for example, the disc, the corneal size, the corneal clarity, a pressure also, so you will be able to differentiate it. Uh, large cornea, megal, simple megal cornea. We know that sim, megal, there's th called, uh, thing, something called simple megal cornea. Again, some authorities believed it is a part of the spectrum of the congenital glaucoma. So, May, you may see a patient with a megalocornea, normal pressure, normal cornea clarity, normal optic nerve head, but this condition, usually bilateral, and you need not to say, okay, this is a megalocornea, simple megalocornea, and go home, and that's it. The, for this reason, they said it's a part of the spectrum, so you need to follow them on a regular basis, for example, annually, two years or so, so they may develop congenital glaucoma. So you have to be uh, aware about this. Then dismet membrane uh, uh, tears and uh, 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 or tears, uh, tears and bands, like birth trauma with forceps delivery. But the breaks in dismet membrane in this situation is usually vertical, unilateral. And uh, among these also, the other thing is the uh, posterior polymorphous, other causes like endothelial infection with rapella, brittle corneal syndrome or eye disease, or eye, eye syndrome, and hypotony can give breaks in the dismet uh, membrane. So you need to be aware about this. Brittle eye syndrome, probably uh, this is a genetic connective tissue called brittle corneal syndrome. Uh, uh, in which the connective tissue is uh, uh, abnormal, especially in the eye, in the ear, in the skin, in the other parts of the body. And those patients with the brittle corneal syndrome, they are more vulnerable to, uh, to, uh, to uh, any mild trauma can lead to rupture of the cornea. So you need to keep this in mind. 
Uh, corneal haze scarring, congenital, this is very important. And there's most of the cases that has been operated as a congenital glaucoma lies in this category. I mean, the, the chet, the, uh, come on, the uh, cornea, or congenital heredity in the theta dystrophy, uh, uh, posterior polymorphous, uh, congenital uh, stromal dystrophy, and so on, and mucobolysaccharides. But here, if you are aware about the CHED, that the CHED doesn't have a megalocornea, large cornea. The, scar, the uh, haze is usually thicker than those we see it in uh, congenital glaucoma. Not only that, but also involving the whole cornea. In, in congenital glaucoma, usually the haze or scar is more centrally and fading as you go peripherally. So, and the pressure, of course, is normal. So you need to keep this in mind. So not every corneal haze may be or might be, yes, but not all of them can be recognized or plotted as a congenital glaucoma. So this is the uh, uh, article that really, it is very helpful. You don't need to read more than that when you talk about uh, the, uh, the uh, differential diagnosis of congenital glaucoma. Corneal haze, again, beta's anomaly, uh, scleral cornea, uh, can be, I mean, again, uh, beta's anomaly also can be uh, 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 shared with the glaucoma. Also, CHED, there is a report that they said it might associate with congenital glaucoma, so you t keep this in mind. Optic nerve head uh, cubbing, uh, physiological cubbing, and this is very difficult sometimes to differentiate between physiological cubbing and pathological cubbing in child. Yes, we know that the cub shouldn't exceed 0.3, but uh, physiological cubbing, the, the pathological cubbing in, ch in children, usually circumferential, usually central, not like in the adult, which have other hints that you say this is a pathological cubbing like vertical uh, elevation or uh, notching and so on. So you need to keep in this in mind. And I think I have uh, uh, other things like uh, 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 optic nerve uh, hypoplasia, uh, coloboma, uh, bits, and so on. So this is, I. Uh, okay, still. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so when we come to the evaluation of the patient, in our practice at King Abdul Aziz, and as far as I know when I was here, uh, the, I would say 98% of cases diagnosed in the clinic, whether under sedation of the child above three months or with during feeding, when you keep the, the child fasting for two or three hours or four, it depends on his age, you can do whatever you want to do. You can do, you can take the pressure, you can take uh, a, a photo, uh, axial length, you can take uh, a, a central corneal thickness, you can do even refraction, you can do everything if the uh, patient is well sedated or kept fasting and he's hangry and when you give him the, uh, 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 the feed, uh, the, when you feed him, he will be very quiet. So in this, during this, you can observe the size and the clarity of the cornea. You can look to the iris and the signs of iris changes in uh, congenital glaucoma, disc evaluation, you can do tonometry, you can, as I said, you can do central cornea thickness, you can measure it, you can look, you can do refraction, you can do many things. As as what you do under general anesthesia. So the, uh, uh, but in general anesthesia, I, de I don't depend much on the pressure, and as you know, some uh, uh, agents, they can reduce the pressure dramatically, so uh, other signs that it is important to examine it under general anesthesia. So especially when you are going to check the pressure or you couldn't get it in the clinic, uh, poor uh, sedation or poor uh, uh, feeding or poor, he's not, I mean, a, or, uh, a, a calm uh, child, you need to make the tonometry before the intubation. Intubation will reduce the pressure uh, dramatically. So external examination, you will do the same thing as we uh, say, corneal diameter measurement, gonioscopy, yeah, gonioscopy, even under sedation or even milk sedation, we have done gonioscopy in many cases, especially with direct gonioscopy uh, and stretchly abortus, stretchly abortus examination also. You can, uh, the media is good, quiet, or clear. You can uh, evaluate the disc and so on. You can take the central cornea thickness, uh, axial length, and uh, this kind if you want, optic nerve, but photography and even refraction of the media, again, allows you to do so. So this is evaluation, but as I told you, I would say 98, I don't remember that I made the diagnosis, and even when I, made the, when I make the diagnosis under general anesthesia, still I'm not comfortable with that. 
there is nothing, I'm not clear. And probably people who worked with me, it's not many, three, four cases in my uh, uh, career. Uh, still there is hesitant, and most of the time I consult my uh, colleagues in pediatric pharmacology and so on. Sometimes, yes, but it is rare to have difficulty if you are aware about the differential diagnosis to, to reach the diagnosis of uh, congenital glaucoma. Tonometry, of course, we <coughs> use Birkin's tonometer. We cannot use Goldman, but it's Birkin's one of the modalities of Birkin's same uh, 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 theory, uh, or tonobin. And most tonotic, we need to be aware, as I said, most tonotic reduce IOB and should be measured before intubation. And if the pressure is asymmetric between both eyes, is more suggestive of a pathology there uh, than a bilaterally borderline IOB. So in general, IOB and the genesthesia, it's not the driving me to reach the orthobody diagnosis. Even sometimes you, reach, you find the, the pressure is 10 or 12. So this means that it is not a glaucomatous patient or conjugal glaucoma, no. You need to look to the other signs, and as we say, the, the general anesthesia, especially after intubation, can change the pressure dramatically. This is Birkin's tonometer. Yeah, I'm sure you all of you are aware. Or even you can use new tonometer, which is available in most of the institutions nowadays. So we need to be aware about the normal uh, uh, normal uh, uh, readings or normal values of uh, uh, IUB regard, regarding the age. For example, from zero or uh, at birth up to one month, it's uh, around, uh, at birth is around nine or even less than that. And there is a report talking about five or six. And it increases with age as you go with age and to reach about in the uh, uh, 16 uh, years of age, reach 14 or the adult. Uh, IUB uh, 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 level. Uh, and again, we need to be aware about in, uh, agents that can decrease the IUB, such as midazolam, oxygen, nitrous oxide, and halothene, uh, and those can increase the uh, IUB, such as fractionalcholine, ketamine, and, uh, and you take intubation. So you need to be aware, aware about these things. The chlorohydrate, which is nowadays, I think, I don't know, is still, uh, Doctor, you are using chlorohydrate, and I don't know, the, and our people, yes, they say that it is a khalas, it probably will be given, but they, it is the best one, and has, doesn't have a, a, a change or effect, or doesn't influence the pressure uh, measurements. Again, normal uh, uh, corneal diameter, we need to remember what are the normal values in regarding the child age. Uh, for example, birth to six months, between nine to 11 or so, and when it is above two years, it reach less than 12. So any, sorry, any, any uh, uh, corneal diameter, horizontal corneal diameter above 12, you need to be suspicious uh, of uh, the disease, in addition to other signs. Gonioscopy, yes, uh, cabi lens, it is very, this way we're using it in the past, but nowadays with the uh, good uh, microscopes, we don't use it anymore, but you can use it with sit lamp or borto sit lamp. Lens provides a surgeon with appearance view of the angle. It's very important, especially to those who are utilizing goniotomy for as a, a, a as uh, a primary procedure for these cases. In normal in newborn, the uh, 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 iris inserts posterior to the sclerous spur, and the uh, trichrome more, more appears more trans, uh, translucent than that of the adult, as well as in congenital glaucoma, the anterior uh, insertion iris could be flat or concave directly to the, uh, 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 inserted directly in the tropical meshwork, and surface of a tropical meshwork has stibbles. I asked my daughter yesterday, what is what she said, munaggar, yani munaggat, okay. Stibbles appearance and meshwork may appear thicker. And occasionally loops of blood vessels, you might see it in the angle uh, from the uh, major circle of the iris. So fundoscopy, as we mentioned, fundoscopy uh, uh, of a child, if the media is good, shouldn't be more than 0.3. However, yeah, in most of the cases, uh, asymmetry is a very uh, suggestive sign 
of glaucoma or of abnormality or a pathology over there. The infant glaucoma scab is often, as I told you, is up around, not like an adult in a glaucomatous uh, uh, child. Uh, uh, with steep walls, central, uh, 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 central, and uh, surrounded by uniform uh, neuroretinal rim. Not there is, you will not see any notching in most cases. You will not see any notching or thinning in certain part of the disc. And when it progresses, tend to be circumferentially. So I think I have a picture for that. Coming again, we need to remember in children, if you're able to to reduce the pressure. Uh, in appropriate time, the cupping can be reduced. This is one of our patients, but the media is not so clear. You can see the large cup, but it is round, not in the, like an adult. And well, this is, I took it from the, uh, uh, from the uh, internet, showing same disc uh, before normalization of the pressure is the same disc and after this. So the re uh, reverse of the cup is the role in children, especially when you remove the stretch over the canal, scular canal posteriorly, will uh, you or reverse the, the, uh, the uh, cup. Treatment, of course, the, we know that the treatment is surgery. It's a surgical disease. But medical treatment is important to reduce intracar pressure and preparation for uh, surgical intervention to clear the cornea, especially when, if you are working or you are going to do goniotomy, and achieve post-op intracar pressure after surgery, you mean, I mean, a supplement, or those sick children due to other syndromes, you need to give it, which is the only thing in your hand at this, uh, in, this point, uh, this point, uh, in this regard. Drugs, of course, we prefer beta blockers, the lowest concentration, 0.25, uh, 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 Temilol, for example, and you need to be aware about the side effects of the uh, beta blockers. Second line, carbonic acid inhibitor, whether systemic or topical, other myotics, prostaglandin analogs, uh, 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 alpha agonists, but we need to be, make sure that uh, uh, alpha 2 adrenergic agonist uh, like promodine, which is promonidine or alpha-gan, it should be contraindicated in a child less than three years or less than uh, 10 pounds uh, in his weight. So shouldn't be given, and you may kill the patient with this medication, so should be avoided in children. So, uh, the, uh, so we, uh, these cases, as I said, the definitive treatment is surgical. And you need to discuss this issue with the parents that this disease might need more than one surgical intervention, so they, be, they should be aware and prepared for that. Goal of surgery, of course, is to normalize the pressure without medication, to clear the cornea, to uh, prevent progression of the cubbing and so on, and to preserve visual field, and to really give chance for the normal development of the uh, visual acuity or the visual system in both eyes. Of course, the classical treat, surgical inter, uh, uh, treatment for uh, uh, congenital glaucoma is goniotomy and trabeculotomy. This goniotomy invented by Barkans in, in uh, mid 40s of last century, probably a decade or so, they invented the trabeculotomy in cases where they couldn't do goniotomy because of the corneal uh, haze, and it still are the procedure of choice as far as I see from the literature in uh, North America and so on. And they give a good results, especially in, the, in, the, uh, in that type of population. And this is probably related to the type of the disease. It differ from, and this is reported even in the literature, the disease in patients that having the uh, autosomal recessive inheritance, it's especially those seen or recognized as a newborn type, it's represent a severe type of disease. So we'll see that later in, in the studies done here. Then in mid-90s or so, I remember we started to um, combine trabeculotomy with trabeculectomy, hoping this will improve the surgical outcome, and it did, actually. So in general, the overall success rate of this procedure ranging from 30 to 90 percent or even more, and this is based on multiple factors. For example, the sample of this, or the size of the sample or the series reported, the duration 
uh, of the follow-up, as well as the severity of the disease and skills of the, or the skills of the surgeon. In general, they are good in certain situations. The engoniotomy you need, as far as I remember when I was resident, Dr. Tommy, he said, and Dr. Uh, anyhow, he said, it should be a crystal clear cornea. I did probably in my career 10 or 12 cases in my, our life, in my life, and it wasn't so common procedure in KCASH at that time, because not it is a difficult procedure, it is very simple, but most of the time the cornea is not, I mean, clear enough to see, to visualize the, uh, 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 the uh, trabecular meshwork precisely. Uh, Pre-operative gonoscopy evaluation is essential, of course, as I mentioned, and uh, you need uh, a lens, not necessarily to be Barkan's words, and there are many lenses and there is many knives also, you can use them even, you can use needle. And the procedure involves entering the anterior chamber and sizing about 120 degrees of the uh, anterior chamber angle of trabecular meshwork and uh, uh, through, uh, uh, yes, and uh, you need to give, as usual, the antibiotic uh, and the steroid probably after uh, 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 the surgery. This is a drawing showing that you enter with sometimes in the butt. Yeah, and you can use heel you you, you, if the wound is small, and uh, there you can, probably you don't need to use anything. And you go and incise the, the trabecular meshwork, but you need to have a really a good view for that. It has advantage, the best advantage of this procedure that I see it is that doesn't injure the conjunctiva and no blip. It's not blip related. This is and rabbit, of course, and really, it's not that safe, as they said, so the more you can have problems with the uh, uh, goniotomy, you can have, you can injure the lens, you can have severe bleeding, traumatize the iris, and so on, so it's not that safe. And this advantage is uh, 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 not possible in cloudy cornea, and requires surgical experience, and this is, can be developed, it's not a big deal. So overall success rate after 12 month follow up, it is in, in Western population, 72 with single goniotomy goes up to 90 uh, with more than one goniotomy in our area here uh, uh, and, in Eastern, and in Asia the, and Africa also. This, the overall success rate doesn't reach 50, probably 30 to 50, and this is indicate the severity of the disease, not the skills of the surgeon, but the severity of the disease. Trabeculotomy, again, it's a good option, and we did a lot of trabeculotomy in the past, and this is utilized when you have a cloudy cornea, uh, and after the goniotomy, this is in the uh, North America, can be combined with trabeculectomy, which is ultimately always nowadays, if you're going to do, uh, going to do trabeculotomy, you have combined with trabeculectomy, uh, and uh, external oxygen, the, the, the procedure, and uh, uh, identify the Schlem's canal, uh, uh, although it is difficult, and you incise about 120 to 140 uh, degrees. And uh, this is a short video, one of our cases, it wouldn't take time. So you, you go for uh, a limbal uh, bariotomy, you don't need to make it big, and then let me fast a little bit. You uh, cauterize and you do, uh, uh, you, you uh, utilize metamazine C, which is universal in our cases. Then make a, a flab similar to that. We do it in trabeculectomy, and this takes about one third, but you need to be aware the, the sclera is thinner than the adult, because, and even normal children because of the large globe and so on. So once you dissect, you don't need to, you don't need to go very, this is probably the metamycin C, you don't need to go further in the corneal side as we'll see later on in other procedures. Then you try to find the uh, Schlem's canal. So you incise at the area where you expect, then verify it, which is also, it's not, a, 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 an accurate verification of the Schlem's canal, then you use the Hans uh, uh, trabeculotome, as you see here, uh, uh, about 140 on both sides, and be sure that you are not involving the uh, iris with you. And you'll find some resident, uh, resistance. This is the trabeculectomy, uh, trabeculotomy. Then just <coughs> take the flab again back and the conjunctiva, and nowadays, as I said, we are joining this with trabeculectomy. 
So in addition to that, we create a, 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 a trabecular opening here and doing a small uh, aridectomy, and then we close. This is, uh, yeah, and unfortunately will help us in controlling the pressure because you are using more than one route of uh, uh, filtration. Then, yes, advantage, uh, uh, an obeycomy can be done with a good success rate, uh, especially in mild cases, and it doesn't need any lenses or so, and disadvantage angle, not visualized directly, and mostly, they said up to 20%, I think, I mean, I'm not sure, it's not more than that, and complication is significant, like the stripping of the digestive membrane, uh, iris dialysis, uh, sometimes with ill-defined limbus, with big uh, 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 eye pole, you may go and even have vitreous, and so on, and we had such a thing in the past. So this is the, what the literature says, Yanni. When you look here, you see that the, uh, our all success is comparable, probably, and when you look to the, our population here in Saudi Arabia, uh, again, uh, no, this is, yeah, uh, uh, has me and uh, our uh, studies. Yeah, it's comparable, yeah, I need there. So, but in different parts of the world, they claim that have a higher success. And again, success depends on the uh, uh, series uh, uh, size, as well as the follow-up period, as well as the uh, severity of the disease. When we come to the, co the uh, 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 combined procedure again, you look to the, our uh, uh, results here, we will see it in a moment. It's again comparable in all uh, population, different pathology and so on, different surgeons. So it is a good procedure, combined procedure, trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy. It is give a good results as we'll see it in a moment. And the over success rate, it's about 70 to 80 after one, uh, 12 months follow up. And this is very important study. I want you to look, to take the, uh, that and read it. It's very careful, very careful. It's a large series of, uh, 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 reported from this institution by Dr. Hasm and his colleagues. They look to the, or compared the outcome of three procedures, the goniotomy, the trabeculotomy, and the combined uh, trabeculotomy and trabeculectomy in 820 eyes of 530 patients, as far as I recall. And they divided the cases in three categories, mild, moderate, and severe, based on level of intracal pressure, le uh, size of the uh, horizontal corneal diameter, as well as far as I know, the severity of the haze. So they found that in mild cases, goniotomy and trabeculotomy giving good or similar, equal in outcome. Of course, you can't compare the combined here because two cases. And when we come to the moderate cases, I hope the moderate, they did coniotomy, not because of the corneal haze, the moderate based on the level of the pressure and corneal size. You see here the success rate of coniotomy is 13% instead of 80 here. And 40% success rate in, in trabeculotomy and 80%. Very clear that it is, it is also it is a retros retrospective study, but we know the limitation, but still we can depend on this study. One with severe cases, of course, there is no rule for the goniotomy, and trabeculotomy is 10% and 70% with combined procedure. Overall, 52 and 41 and 75%. This is, the, this is very important study, very, very important, so you need to read it, please. So, uh, Gren mentioned that uh, in one of his, uh, his letters to the editor, uh, the editor that he said that the surgery of conical glaucoma is a neglected uh, uh, issue in our practice. Of course, they are even in Western and they don't have such number of patients that we have. So the treatment uh, has been a little bit changed in the last 20 years, uh, being a newly emerging surgical techniques or modification of existing techniques. So, uh, for example, like viscocanalostomy or vis visco-trabeculotomy, the same trabeculotomy, but they inject viscoelastic material to uh, keep the uh, 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 Schlem's canal or the trabeculotomy open, and as well as 360 trabeculotomy, whether with the 
uh, a suture or with a, a, a illuminated uh, uh, catheter. And they claim, and there is a recent study from China, and I think from Dr. Jadan and his colleague here, in, as a secondary procedure, they report a good results with 360 uh, trabeculotomy with uh, illuminated catheter. And in the scope of goniotomy, it's still uh, immature. Deep sclerotomy, it is the more now utilized procedure in conjugal glaucoma in Europe and here. So, and when you look to the literature, you find uh, some, or uh, not, I mean, a common disease there, but you find a limited number of studies. And when you look to this study, you see the other also accessory. If you excluded German or uh, LOC study, which really, when you see the 10 cases, None of them is suitable for deep sclerectomy. All of them has been operated mo more than one time, and I don't think it's a, 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 a study that we can get anything from it. So uh, the rest of the study, when you looked at the overall uh, results, it's comparable. Dif despite being different pathology, different surgeons, which indicates that this procedure probably has something special in this uh, disease. And not only that, we know the glaucoma surgery, the, the, the classic tre uh, uh, surgical treatment is associated with, uh, I mean, trabeculotomy, trabe uh, goniotomy, and combined trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy, with significant number of serious uh, 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 complication. In this series, no serious complication happened except in one which had, this one had, uh, uh, end of thalamus later on, and so on. Otherwise, uh, there is no uh, significant complication. Uh, and uh, just to share you with, with you our uh, study of uh, published uh, uh, of uh, uh, 143 eyes of 120 patients, and majority of them were uh, uh, primary conjugal glaucoma 130. And the as you see here, when you look to the uh, uh, all the indices checked under sedation or milk uh, sedation, we can say it. And the pressure is 31, and the corneal head is 2.1, the mean corneal head from uh, trace to uh, plus 4. And we uh, uh, excluded all the previously operated eyes. So all the eyes hasn't been touched, and this is one procedure. And this is the the procedure is very quick, very simple. I don't know if people are afraid of it. You create a flap, but here the flap, you need to extend it a little bit more in, uh, on the corner side, and then create the second flap. As you see here, this is what I'm saying. Second, once you reach the uh, trabecular air, uh, uh, canal area and go beyond it, remove the uh, juxtacalicular with it, which is, has been proven historically, you see the oozing of the fluid of the aqueous. That's mean the inner part of the trabecular meshwork has no problem with that. And there is no membrane prevent aqueous. In addition, indicate that really the pathology in the outer part of the trabecular meshwork, I mean juxta canal liquor as well as uh, Schlem's canal, or there is no Schlem's canal. So you need to open the, 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 the uh, uh, view or open the uh, uh, area for the aqueous to leave the eye. So you will see the uh, Beautiful oozing here indicates that there's nothing central or in deeper and, uh, uh, and in inner layers of the trabecular meshwork. Then you cut the, the uh, deep layer and you can use heron or implant as, as you like. There are many implants, or even you can without anything. And this is uh, the procedure. So uh, our results we did uh, we uh, uh, achieved almost 82% complete success with a mean follow-up of three and a half years, ranging from six months to 10 years. And the overall success rate is 86, which hasn't been reported in our population with, as a, with one procedure before. And not only that, but also the most important gimmicks of this procedure it is the lack of complication. The only complication that I didn't put the old slide with this procedure and this series is four cases shallow chamber, two cases uh, hyphema, and one case uh, 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 scleral uh, ectasia, which revealed later on is not an ectasia, but the iris was uh, uh, going to the surgical wound. So this is very important. So, and this is when you look at again uh, the when we compare deep sclerectomy with the primary congenital glaucoma, mainly you see again a comparable results 
of the, uh, this procedure with no much uh, 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 complication. So we concluded from this study that deep hysterectomy is if effective with high safety profile in congenital glaucoma, and it's short to, to be the first option in ma managing uh, congenital glaucoma, and actually it is now, since the, about 2001, I would say 98% of our cases with all our colleagues compensed by this procedure and all cases are at the primary procedure or even secondary procedure is deep scrotomy. Even here, and uh, with Dr. Jadana, you know, I'm not sure about the others. Probably you can tell us my colleagues here, as a primary procedure. So it is really, as at least it's as effective as the conventional treatment, but has a much less serious complication than the conventional treatment. And we concluded from that study that high degree of uh, uh, preoperative corneal haze is a, a risk factor for failure. So this is if you want to read more about the uh, article. It is uh, uh, read, uh, published about uh, probably six years or so. And now we are doing, now here, to convince people you need to convert this procedure to the conventional treatment, which is the combined procedure. And now we almost, it's uh, Iman uh, Sharif here, not here. So we are now trying to write, analyze, and write uh, our, uh, which we started to, uh, 2010, uh, comparing in bilateral cases, deep hysterectomy versus combined trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy, and this will give us the end uh, or the final results, which one we should go with. And this will be published, I hope, within a short time. So. End point of our, our, our end point in managing this uh, uh, disease is to normalize the intracorporeal pressure, to clear the cornea, to reverse, as I said, cupping, and stabilize axial length. So the prognosis, as I said, is best with the infantile type that diagnosed between one month and 24 months, give the best results, and uh, 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 early diagnosis and prompt treatment can preserve vision. Responsibility of surgeon doesn't stop at this at the at the uh, procedure itself, you need to rehabilitate the eye and make sure that everything is in, in, in order. And the most uh, opposite mo or uh, uh, sad mo uh, moment that I see when I see a child with a very successful procedure, clear corner, crystal clear, healthy disc, everything, and the vision is low because he has uh, amblyopia. So this is really a very hurting issue. So rehabilitation is not less than the importance of controlling the pressure, and we need to, uh, again, discuss the uh, 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 course of the disease with the family and to know that this is a protect, protracted course and they need to pay attention and to help the surgeon to uh, 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 help in preventing or combating the amblyopia. I will stop at this point and uh, receive your uh, questions. Thank you very much. Questions, Mashallah. Yeah? Yes? Do you think that this is, uh, if you apply the mic, might to be before or after the lab? This is a good question. And most, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in West, they have life before they do it with lab, even trabeculectomy and so on. And, but we need to remember that the pathology, especially <coughs> the trabeculectomy or even the children, the, uh, it's, it, it's more aggressive here. So you need, you, you may point, you are, you are uh, probably pointing that the, the possibility of the toxicity that may go to the serial body and these things and affect the pressure. I don't think, always, first of all, we are using, always using 0.2 milligram per ml. We are not going higher than that. So I believe, and uh, I think it's better, but as from side effects point of view, we are not aware about hypotony, present hypotony, either, uh, even in, in our prolonged hypotony in children never been, at least in our hands. And I think it's, you can do both, but I prefer to go for after creating the flap. Yes, Shanta. Ah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saleh, for this uh, great presentation and overview of this very important topic actually in our society. So uh, my question is, uh, still deep sclerectomy is a valid option in uh, secondary congenital glaucoma? And what are the outcomes in secondary congenital glaucoma? Yeah, yeah. 
in that reported study, when you, if you read it, you will find four cases of stage over syndrome. Stage over syndrome, of course, it's always, it's a kind of ground, but always, always. Even not deep scrotum only, it's a non-penetrating deep scrotum. I do my best not to perforate. It is a great outcome. We had 12 cases, 80% without medication, and four they need supplement. But they are controlled, and there is a long follow-up. In uh, other uh, neurofibratosis, for example, that we have experience with it, and, uh, and, and iridia and so on, most of the time we go and do penetrating one penetrating deep scrotomy. Many people you say that, well, see, you did the penetrating. Still, I believe the advantage of deep scrotomy or non-penetrating non deep scrotomy is still there, depending on the multiple routes that we are achieving with deep scrotomy, especially the uv scleral outflow and the intrascleral. We're losing one of the advantages that we don't enter the eye. Also, we don't take a bunch from the limbal area or bulk of tissue. Once it's penetrated, we just, uh, the prolapsing iris, we cut the, pro uh, the prolapsed iris. So, yes, in, in severe cases, I might go for penetrating deep scrotomy rather than non penetrating. But in, uh, uh, in stage war syndrome, I would do my best not to penetrate. All yes. Right. What about trabeculotomy in addition to the deep scrotum? There is a report from Egypt, and they reported, I don't know if it was there or not, I think. They reported 10 cases, and they said that the result is 100%. But, uh, you know, uh, the little, I mean, you, you don't need to go for everything. So you can say, OK, I will do deep scrotomy, I will do trabeculotomy and trabeculectomy. I might put a tube also at the same time. I don't think, I think it should be stepwise. Uh, you know, you have to be, uh, you pay attention to the complications that might occur. So. You need to, the procedure is not only uh, the success or the control of the pressure. You may end with a mystery, you know, by uh, 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 dangerous or severe complications. So you need stepwise. I don't, and I don't believe in this, or, or at least I'm not convinced until now to go for deep scrotomy with uh, trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy. But there are reported, especially from one from Egypt, the one I talk about. Yes. No question. Yes. Always. Yes. Always. Always. When I uh, in trabeculectomy and deep scrotomy, uh, you know, the in the past we were doing. You mean uh, even utilizing the inferior parts or quadrants? But nowadays it is. I would say probably, especially in filtering uh, or penetrating surgery, should be contradicated at least, you know, because of the rate of the endophthalmite, which has been reported to be more with inferior part. Uh, so always I keep an area for possible second procedure. So I go severe nasal or severe temporally, which is easier for you. Yes. Dr. Saleh, if uh, the primary DS failed, do we have to revise it? Or do, we, or do we go for, for another DS yeah. or another optional like tubes? Yeah. I learned from my teacher, uh, Karim Toma, uh, 30 years or more, that uh, when you have a, fail, fail, a, a, a failing uh, or absolute failure of the procedure, don't go and work in the same area. So do the same procedure or another procedure in different quadrants. So, I prefer if I couldn't, uh, I mean, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, procedure, either. you go for another uh, quadrant and do the same procedure or different procedure. I don't like to go and operate in the same uh, quadrant that has been violated before, the scarring, especially in children, when you're talking about children, even in adults or uh, patient in, in 40, 50, 60, uh, uh, in our population. Uh, it's rarely I go, and children never, in, 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 in adult, I might go, it depends from case to case, but it's very minimal number that I revise the blip uh, and uh, to uh, resume the function of the blip. Uh, I go to a uh, different uh, quad quadrant, if there is a quadrant, uh, I mean, uh, untouched. Okay. Thank you very much.
ترى كل ده عشانك يا عادل عشان ايش ما نعصلك عشان ما نعط عشان ما نعطلك عشان ما نعطلك شيء الفيديو هو اللي يأكد انه شغال
Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today, Prof. Suhaibani is going to talk about a very interesting topic. As you know, Prof. Suhaibani is well known to all of us. He's a professor and chief of the oculoplastic and orbital unit at King Abdelaziz University Hospital. And he's the uh, deputy president of the Saudi Ophthalmological Society, too. The most important issue. He is one, if not the best oculoplastic surgeon in terms of cosmetic surgery in the very ocular area. So if you have any question, any concern, if you have uh, any clarification, any advice, he's the best guy to ask. Please, Prof. Suhaibani. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Masikum bil khair jamiyan. Dr. Yasser, the best is really hard, but I'm trying to be a good, as good as you trust me. Um, uh, we're going to talk today about something uh, It's really common. It's not all common, it's very common. And uh, the problem is we don't touch much on it in our uh, presentation, even in the hospital base, because this procedure is not a hospital based procedure. It's mostly uh, cosmetic and private based procedure. But the problem is what we see in our hospital base is the complication of it. We don't see the beauty of it. So I'm trying to give you offer a few about uh, my limited experience in this area. Um, and you know, most of the time we use filler to uh, address some of aging changes and some also, also aesthetic changes. Doesn't need to be an uh, aging changes. But mainly when you, when you read about topic, the topics of filler, people will talk about aging and how is the aging process. And uh, it's, it's always um, now the, the, with the understanding of aging and volume loss and descent with aging, there is a conceptual, a conceptual uh, shift from uh, traditional surgery which involved excising and removing as much skin and fat to more of volume uh, uh, replacement and more uh, tre treatment of the skin laxity to improve the outcome. And uh, the filler material is really uh, becoming so popular after changing the concept of uh, addressing these uh, uh, cosmetic uh, concern and rejuvenation. Um, uh, facial fillers are used uh, to broad spectrum of, the, of individual that in, uh, seeking a minimum cosmetic enhancement to uh, to uh, help uh, rejuvenating them. And sometimes we do it even after surgery. So surgery is not a solution for everything. So when you want to augment your surgery results, sometimes you need to do uh, either filler or botox injection. It depends on the concern of the uh, individual. Uh, with injectable uh, products, uh, including, uh, uh, including non-office and uh, non-phase of procedure, quick, and result you see it Im immediately, that make it so popular and very commonly used. Um, the, the, the filler are really a lot. And every now and then we get a, a product and some either from the same family or different family. So uh, it's one of the topic that is not easy to keep track of it unless you are really following it, uh, let's say year by year. Um, when, you, when you talk about fillers, there are different families or different things that you can use for filling. Um, the, um, many people are familiar with uh, collagen, which used long time ago. Nobody is using it now. The main reason for it is that it's, it's a short acting compared to hyaluronic acid. And also it's taken from uh, uh, animal uh, origin, it's a bovine origin. So there is a concern about allergy and uh, the patient may be sensitive to it. Uh, hyaluronic acid will be the topic of today. Uh, there is also the common product used, but not in the periorbital area, is uh, calcium um, hydroxybutate, which is called radius, that can be used. Some people, they use it in the malar area to augment the bone, but not in the uh, supraorbital, uh, subirisalcus, sorry, or tear trap. Uh, it's used a lot in the hands and other parts of the body. Uh, there is a sculpture which induce more uh, collagen formation. It's, it's not that common because it takes time and the result of that, it's not that predictable. Uh, 
uh, fat, it's really becoming, it's, it's come, is the, one of the oldest procedure, but it's now becoming more and more popular with the enhancement of the result with the new techniques and using very fine cannulas, the results are becoming better than before. So it's becoming uh, really fair, uh, common than uh, what used to be uh, uh, decades ago. Uh, we have um, silicon, which is not used really in the periorbital area. And we have also the permanent filler, which is considered absolute and should not be used in the periorbital area. Uh, hyaluronic acid gets the approval of, of DA in uh, 1996. Then in the early uh, 2000, get the approval for cosmetic use. Then from there, it's becoming so popular. Uh, uh, here, just I want you to pay attention to this. Uh, globally, the number of uh, filler in 2014 exceeded 5.5 million. And, in 16, and also in 16. And, uh, and in, it expected that in, um, in the US alone, in this year, they will have 2.5 million of filler injection. So it's really a lot of uh, products being injected, and a lot of people are using it from different specialties. Uh, hyaluronic acid is now is the most common one, and um, and you know the the expected money revenue for 2020 in US it's around 11 billion out of this product. So it's a big business. Uh, hyaluronic acid is a, a naturally occurring uh, linear polymeric, uh, polymeric uh, dimers and it's present in the body. However, the hyaluronic acid component in, in all connective tissue uh, builds up the blocks of the polysaccharides. Uh, uh, the natural occurring hyaluronic acid has a, a little or no role in functional and aesthetic treatment because of its rapid turnover and degradation. So it not, cannot be used as a cosmetic filler or a product. That's why the synthetic filler came in play. And how they manufacture it is, uh, is by more cross-linking, and they make it more resistant to degradation and stays longer in the body. Syn the synthetic uh, foreign body, I'm um, sorry, synthetic hyaluronic acid is, uh, uh, is, is uh, manufactured with, uh, by uh, cross-linking of the hyaluronic acid that make it more viscous and also more uh, stable and uh, stays for longer time. And then the, uh, in the market, there is different hyaluronic acid products, and they differ in, uh, in, the, t in the degree of cross-linking, and also they differ in degree of the molecule itself. So different concentration, different micro size, different cross-linking affect the product, and the type of the product to be used, is it heavy product or thin product, and that will be we'll be talking about in shortly. Uh, the, the, the filler typically, uh, when you tell patient, it stays from six to uh, 24 months in the body, but it can stay longer or less. It depends on the, uh, the amount of degradation each person has for the hyaluronic acid. Uh, how they manufacture hyaluronic acid? It's manufactured by, uh, from bacteria fragmentation and culture of the streptococcus species. Um, this, this product is not an animal uh, or animal uh, origin product, so it's less likely to cause sensitivity and allergic reaction compared to collagen that used before. And the, and the, and the, and the beauty that the chemical and molecular composition of natural hyaluronic acid is well maintained throughout all the living organisms. So if you see the structure of hyaluronic acid in bacteria, or produced by bacteria similar to the one we produce in our body, so that make it more compatible and less problematic for the, for the people. I'm not gonna say patients here, okay? So forgive me for this. Uh, hyaluronic acid uh, don't, uh, usually don't uh, boss a specific uh, tissue or a specific uh, uh, species, that's why it's, it's universal. And that's why it's uh, less likely to cause a cell-mediated immune reaction. Um, uh, the filler it has two, uh, let's say, roots. We have a functional root and cosmetic uh, root. The uh, non-aesthetic uh, use of filler, it's been proposed for using it for uh, rehabilitation for patients who are not ready for surgery or they cannot, you cannot do surgery at this time. It's been uh, reported to be used as anterior lamella expansion in case of short skin, especially after bilifaropathy with scar, uh, uh, with the sub, uh, with the scarring in the, in the anterior lamella. 
and also it can be used as a spacer and can be used for lid retraction. And also they've been reported for patients with facial palsy to help them closing the eye well. And uh, also can be used for as an expansion of the orbital volume, either in sighted or unsighted eyes that's been reported. Um, my experience with using it in, in functional one is not that great. I, I, I found the good result when I, we, when I use a thick product for anophthalmic sockets, it gives me a good result. But as a spacer for the, let's say, expanding the skin, it's not the way I expected. So most of these patients I use for them this product, I had to go to do surgery later on. So it's more of a temporary measure than really an effective permanent measure. Uh, what about the aesthetic use for it, which is the more really more common and uh, popular uh, use for this for this uh, tool? Um, as we know that with aging, there is a different change in the orbital area. We have malar fat, bad descent, and atrophy, and there is thinning of the orbital septum, and that's why we have a fat prolapse, and the exposure of orbicularis retain, retaining ligament that making more deep uh, depression below the eyelid. Um, uh, hyaluronic acid offers really a good alternative tool with rapid result and uh, uh, minimum downtime, um, minimum downtime for patient to uh, go back to their usual activity. It's really important that before using filo to get the key keys for success, and the keys for success land in different things. Patient factor is really important with patient expectation. Product selection is really important. There is some product good in one area, other product good in the other area. And also uh, the choice of procedure, which, which procedure do you use? Do you use a cannula or do you use a needle? And where, where is the injection can be done safely? That's really important too. Uh, it's, it's really important before doing any cosmetic procedure is to take really a thorough history for cosmetic history and medical history. And there is something here is really important, and I, I'm, I'm facing big issue with it, is body dysmorphic features. So it's really important. Maybe you don't see it a lot in the hospital base, but we see it a lot in the private base, because some people, they ask for something. I'm sorry, but it's not acceptable. So if you go behind patient and listen to them, try to do a reasonable thing, and your ultimate result should be natural result. I, I feel so happy when I, when I do a treatment for a person they go out and they come to tell me again, people, they see my eye looks better, but they don't know what I had done. This is for me is the certificate of successful uh, cosmetic procedure, either for surgery or for feral. If the eye looks unnatural, that means what you have done is something not good. Um, hyaluronic acid concentration, as we mentioned, is different, a different concentration and also different in, uh, in the cross-linking, and that's why you need to know these product in detail before using them so you can make advantage of their advantages and disadvantages in your uh, right uh, the choice. As you mentioned, high degree of cross-linking, that's Im improve the viscosity and also improve the longevity of the, uh, of the hyaluronic acid. One of the common questions we get in the, in the clinic, if I have, for example, one product of hyaluronic acid injected, can I get another different product injected? The answer is yes, because most of, most of these products are really um, compatible and there is no cross-reaction between them. I'm talking about hyaluronic acid. Okay. Before doing any procedure, cosmetic or even functional, it's good to take, document that. And for echoblasty, we document it with uh, photography. So it's, it's really good to take a good photos from different angles to document the changes and also the improvement after a procedure. It's really important before using it also to make sure of the aesthetic uh, technique and make sure that there is no uh, really um, risk for inducing infection when you introduce the, need, uh, the needle or the cannula uh, uh, under the skin. Uh, it's really important before injecting the periorbital area to know the facial anatomy and more important to know the blood vessels or the arterial anatomy because vascular occlusion is the nightmare of using injectables around the uh, area. Uh, uh, one of the big issue people are talking about is shall we use needle or cannula? So I'm going to mention about it in the uh, in the few minutes. 
Again, understanding the anatomy, it's really important to get the really outcome that you're really looking for. Look, imagine the eye and you look at the blood vessels. And you see there is supraorbital, supratricular, and also there is infraorbital and there is angular artery. Injection nearby these will induce the, the product into the artery and this will may lead to permanent visual loss. So it's really important when you work in this area to be really cautious and use uh, the highest precaution possible to avoid vascular occlusion. Um, the wise injection technique is to use a slow injection speed with the least amount of pressure because you don't want to introduce the product in the, in the arterial system with a small bolus as much as possible. So you inject a little, then increase it by a little and little. Um, superficial placement of the product may lead to adverse effect and irregularity and the uh, blue-gray dyschromia that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. Physicians should understand the relative flex and advantage of the needle and, and, and the cannula. If we use a needle, it's more risk to penetrate the, into blood vessels. If you use a cannula, it needs to be a blunt cannula and bigger size, like 25 or more. That helps uh, having the chance of penetrating blood vessels is way less. And it should be a blunt, and especially in the area of a dangerous zone, nearby the glabellar area or nearby the angle of the eye where the major blood vessels are uh, present. What are the sites for filler injection? They're multiple in the face and outside the face. So in this presentation, I'm not gonna talk about all of them. I'm gonna talk only about two sites that commonly been injected. First one I'm gonna talk about is the tear trough. Tear trough is a depression that line between the nose and the eyelid. And this is a very common area for injection for improving the depression and also for the uh, dark circles. It's helped improving the dark circles because hyaluronic acid, beside being um, filling, it also improves the hydration of the skin. So the, uh, the color will improve after that. Also, we inject in the bulbibra malar groove to improve it and a little bit in the nasojugular fold. There are different techniques of injecting the uh, the tear trap. The one I use, I use a cannula, and I introduce, introduce it from a little bit of distance, so one, one board will be enough to fill all the area. And this is the technique I use. So from an exit near, uh, a little bit far from the area, I, I, I puncture the skin with a, a needle. Then after that, I use, I use the cannula. Then I go in the, the tear trough itself. Then I go all the way up high to the area that I need to be treated, which typically I start from this area here. Then by, I go and inject slowly, and that helps for me to see what I'm injecting and the volume I'm injecting and I go and increase uh, little by little. Then after that, I go, I, in, I inject the, uh, the fold in, in, in the other side of the eyelid. Then I leave amount, a little amount to inject the fold, the nasogagular fold. By this one, I, usually when I inject, I try not to fill things because hyaluronic acid is hydrophilic, so it will attract some fluid. So try not to do the maximum correction do a little bit like 75% of the correction, then ask the patient to come or ask the customer to come a week or 10 days after. By that time, the fluid will be absorbed and the final result will be achieved. If you are happy with it and the customer is happy, you can stop at that stage. Otherwise, you can inject more. The, the problem, if you inject more, you need after 10 days or so to dissolve it. And when you dissolve it, you cannot control how much you dissolve. You can control how much you add, but you cannot control what, how much you take by uh, hyaluronidase. This is one of the examples. This patient came with the folds that she's not happy with and also the dark circles. And this is after the injection. This patient, is ha she's having fat prolapse, as you can see here, and there is some depression. She's not interested in blepharoplasty, so uh, uh, filler injection is a, it's a good uh, technique. In this patient, I injected her with needles. So you see, with needles, you need to do multiple passes to go because the needle is short. The cannula, the beauty of it, you, from one single uh, 
let's say one single entry, you can treat the whole lower eyelid. For the needle, you cannot do that. So you need to do multiple passes. With each, in, with each needle uh, introduction, there is a chance for uh, bruises. So bruises is more common with needle compared to cannulas. But also needles is very good. I use the needle a lot when I do well-defined area that for augmentation, I use the needle because I control it better than the cannula. But for initial treatment with a broader area, the cannula is better. And this is just from the side to show you the improvement and the uh, depression following the, uh, the treatment. This patient, she had, uh, she had filler injecting a long time ago that caused for her inflammation. And this is, you can see the depression in this area here. And also you can see it clear. The, the option to treat this one, either you use fat grafting, which is really a good option, or you can use filler. But she wants something fast and quick, so filler was the uh, thing we agreed on. And you can see the improvement in the lateral profile here. That really raised it, and the skin color also improved after the treatment. Um, this is the patient that came to me because she had an injection of filler. And you can see it is bulging. That's why I'm telling you when, you when you inject, do a little and increase. If it's more, you cannot take it out. So you have to dissolve it. And this is what happened to this patient. We dissolved this patient. This patient is a really better candidate for blepharoplasty. Filler is not that good, great option for this patient. Because what happened when you want to equal the, the elevation and the fat prolapse, you need to increase the amount. And this is a, a very common thing people do. Uh, they, they want to equal, they inject the filler to make the filler uh, in the tear trough uh, as little as the prolapse fat. For me, this is not correct. When you inject the filler, your aim is to equali equalize it with the tissue behind the tear trough, not the tissue above the tear trough. Meaning, when you inject the filler, you, should, you, should, you, you aim to have it at the level of this tissue, not the level of the fat prolapse. If you aim to have it at the level of fat prolapse, this is what you are going to end up with. You will end up with bulging. This is not natural at all. So what's natural is you aim to have it equal or at the level of the, of the tissue under it. So it will be smooth, and you'll have a little bit of fat herniation. It will be less than before, but at least better. But for this patient, is blepharoplasty is a better option. This is, again, to highlight the same issue. This patient being injected a lot to equalize it with the fat prolapsing up, which is not the correct thing. Correct thing, if you, ha if you want really to have it equal to do a blepharoplasty. What you aim when you do filler injection to equalize it with the tissue in the lower part of the tear trough, not the upper part of the tear trough. Um, this is another interesting uh, patient. She, she came, uh, actually, she came to me after having the right eye, be, or both eyes being injected by a really expert injector. Uh, she came because the filler was, uh, she told me she was, she was uh, both eyes were okay, but after the filler injection, she had bulging here compared to the other side. So what do you think it happened? Any? Uh, no. Yeah. What happened is what, they, what you call a retro, retroceptal injection. Some people, they, they don't, from anatomical point of view, they go behind the septum, and they inject in the orbital fat. When you inject in the orbital fat, this is what you, you are going to augment the fat prolapse. And this is what happened to this patient. But I know the injector is really good. So what I assume is happening is sometimes we have a defect in the orbital septum. When you inject the sum of the filler, it may go through the orbital, dehiscent to the orbital septum, and will line up in the, in the fat because it's less resistant, because the tear trough is a little bit resistant because there's a ligamental area and the tight space. So it will be more easy for the filler to sneak through that defect and reach the uh, orbital fat and becoming part of the orbital fat. And you can see here, when she looks up, you see the rays in the fat. And when she looks back, down is improving. That means all the filler was sitting there. So this patient we injected with Y days, and she improved a lot, but I, I asked her to go for another injection, but she was okay with one injection. What about the severe sulcus, another common area I inject? It's um, usually I inject it with a cannula, not the needle, because 
the, this area is, is considered a really dangerous area. We have supraorbital uh, supra vessels, and here we have supratricular. So it's really a dangerous area. I, I inject it with a cannula, and I like to inject with 25 can, uh, gauge cannula because it's less likely to penetrate the, the blood vessels. I use it two sites. Sometimes if I want if I want to treat this area, I go from entrance in this area, from around the mid of the eyelid. And if I, if I want to treat the whole area, I go from here. Usually when I inject the filler, I aim to line it below the orbital uh, rim, not in the soft tissue. Because what happens if you line the soft tissue, it will start to accumulate and you cannot mold it and you cannot uh, smoothing it out. So I, what I found it really good is to go behind the, uh, immediately under the bone and inject it under the bone. By this way, you can mold it against the bone. But if you inject it in the soft tissue, you cannot, nothing really hard to mold it around it and make it smooth. Um, I found it really helpful in, in several situations. This is one of the patients I like to present. This patient came to me because she's not happy about the uh, her eye is different than the other eye. Uh, this is what we call facial asymmetry, which is a really common thing, and it's really important to document that before doing any cosmetic procedure, because people will blame you for a facial asymmetry if you tell them after the procedure. But if you explain to them that they have facial asymmetry ahead of time, they will understand that and they will accept the result and the uh, effort you are doing. So in her case, you can do, you can remove part of the skin here to make this one hollow, but she wasn't interested. So what I did, I inject filler in this area to induce some fullness, and this is what she got. It's more like even and bitter symmetry compared to before, with just simple injection that stays for, I think, two years, and she came again for retreatment. So this is a good tool in severe sulcus. This is, this is another interesting patient. This patient, she, uh, she was so obese, and she had um, bariatric surgery, and she lost a lot of weight. And she came because you can see how much really very deep sulcus. And you can see the bone here. It's like, um, it's, it's way more than her age. So she came for improvement. The option we have either to inject fat or fillers. So because the fat takes time to go to do it and dose, and you go do it under, uh, I mean in surgery or in a brighter groom, we agreed to inject filler. And you can see the improvement after the filler. This is with single injection, so we can in increase it later on, but she was happy with the single injection. And you can see the improvement from this deep, you see the bone here, and you can see here. And this is another patient, um, another customer. Uh, this patient, she's not happy about the deep sulcus she has. She has here above the eyes, and this is her treatment. I mean, she's after treatment, immediately after the injection. This is another patient. This is another patient for, I do a lot of severe cycles, unfortunately, because m most of the dermatologists, they don't want to do it, so they refer it to me. Other, other interesting application of uh, filler in the eyelid is after blepharoplasty. This nice man, he came for, maybe use the pointer. Yeah, this nice man, he came for blepharoplasty. We did the blepharoplasty in both upper lids, but he wasn't happy, happy about this fall. And this time happened because of the fibrosis happened in the upper eyelid. So we waited for six months, I'm um, sorry, six weeks. It didn't improve much. So I offered him doing a uh, filler injection, and you see the result. How, how can you smooth the fold with just filler injection? So it's another rescue tool that you can do to augment your cosmetic uh, result. This patient, he had the depression. This patient has a depression because of old uh, trauma, and you can see depression here. And this is after filling it with uh, HA filler. So it gives really improvement in the, in the way the uh, bone and reshaping the bone above the eye. Yeah. This patient, she presented because she had filler injection in the upper, an upper eyelid and lower eyelid, and she wasn't happy with the uh, of the filler because you can see the eyelid is booming in the upper lid and also you can see this is not a natural appearance. So what they did, I dissolved all this filler because she's really a, not a candidate for filler, she's a candidate for surgery. 
And this is his hair after three weeks after surgery. This is another patient. Um, Actually, this is selfie. She sent me the selfie. She came for, she wasn't happy about the filler injected here. She injected elsewhere, actually outside the kingdom, and she came for consultation. When I saw her, I found the filler material is a little bit thick. So when you inject the filler material in the superior sulca, it should be ultra thin filler. And the filler I use is, is really thin filler in the uh, uh, superior sulcus, in, in a tear trough, a little bit thicker filler. And in the malar area, we, would, we need to use the very thick filler because that's a deep area and you want to have a really build up for the malar area. So what, after, this is her picture after dissolving the filler. And she sent selfie after a week. Okay, we'll talk now about complications. Um, there is no procedure or no intervention without complication. Our job is to recognize it or actually prevent it. If it's happened anyway, we need to recognize it early and treat it. Complication usually re related to different things. It can be related to the product itself, if you're not choosing the right product in the right place, and or also if you don't know what's the property of that product, if it's cross-linked or the size or et cetera. And other bad things is in the market, we have a lot of bad products, especially coming from Asia. And the way they manufacture it is really terrible. It's induced a lot of edema, a lot of inflammation, because the quality of product is not important. It's not really high standard. Usually when I inject filler for a patient, I give them the product I inject, so they know that it's a really good product. And also if they go to another uh, provider or they have any problem, they know what the type of product being injected. Uh, the, the other thing is related to the procedure itself. Where you inject? Are you injecting the right plane deep enough? Are you avoiding the vascular uh, or high risk zones that we talked about? And also, are you using a needle or a cannula? All this play a role in, in avoiding this complication. Patient related bra uh, complication can happen. Some patient, when you inject, or uh, some customer, if you inject in one area, they, they rub that area so the filler will move from the area that you injected to another uh, area. When you have a patient with uh, upper respiratory tract infection or recent infection and you inject them, there is high chance for having inflammation in the area. And um, other thing, if, you, if, if you're doing a patient something that you want to blaze them and they're not a good candidate for it, this is another potential for complication. And most of the time it's multifactorial. It's not only related to one thing. A hematoma, a hemat uh, uh, it's, it's really rare to have hematoma, but it's more common to have bruises. So bruising, usually you see it immediately after the procedure, and sometimes can happen uh, secondary to uh, direct puncture of the vessels or delay onset, and that happen after uh, the, sw the swelling of the filler happen one day or two days, so some of the blood vessels may be breached and the bruises happen. It can be minimized by avoiding blood thinners and, uh, and all, uh, medication and also with some supplement like ginger or other things that cause uh, the blood to be more, um, uh, more li uh, li liable for uh, bruises. Um, other thing we just talked about is la using large cannulas to help in decreasing the bruises because there is less chance for uh, injuring the blood vessels. Uh, blue gray discrom uh, disc uh, Dyschromia, or some people, they call it tendal effect. It's another really common issue that we see it commonly in the, uh, in the tear trough area. And it's, we, we mean by, by the gray uh, dyschromia is the blue light color scattered. And this is, um, <clears throat> it's very common in the tear trough area. And why it's happening, people don't know exactly. But one of the proposals is that the light passing through the uh, colloid has a bluish tinge. And the, with the dispersion of the light, the bluish coloration happens, and this is why the sky is blue. And this is uh, one patient. You can see the superficial injection, and you can see the what you call it, the blue uh, coloration or blue hue because of superficial injection of the filler. The other proposal for uh, the, this blue uh, dyschromia is uh, bubble, uh, actually proposed by uh, Rotman and uh, Goldberg that with injection you push the veins up a little bit and this makes the bluish discoloration uh, apparent, which myself am not that convinced by it. 
Um, there is some question about which product causing this blues more than, uh, is it a certain product or any product? Actually, it's been reported in all hyaluronic acid products, so it's not one product, it's more brown than other product. It's, it's interesting, can be seen early, after a few weeks, or it also can appear later on, and it's been reported months to years after the procedure. It's not something that you have to see immediate. How you manage it, if it's uh, uh, possible to do it, to, to cover it with the makeup, that will be good, and also skin care. If it's not, you need to dissolve it with uh, hyaluronidase. Uh, early onset nodules is another uh, frequent issue, and this is, can be uh, seen early, immediately after the injection, and this is related to the technique itself. And you can see uh, lumping and uh, pumping of the tissue, so we need to do a massage to soften that one. However, it can have been delayed or mean weeks after the procedure, and it's been reported up to 0.5% of hyaluronic acid treatment. Uh, such nodules appear years even after a treatment, and we don't know exactly what's the cause, but the problem is that our periorbital area, one of the common area that for these nodules to happen. Uh, they thought that uh, present of uh, systemic or local infection or immuno uh, or, um, or other uh, systemic infection may trigger this uh, inflammation to happen uh, as uh, later on after the injection. <clears throat> uh, delayed uh, nodules also been uh, found more with the, uh, with the product that with time, because the high mercury weight of hyaluronic acid is anti-inflammatory, but with the low molecular weight, which happening with degradation with time, becoming a pro-inflammatory, and this may result to uh, nodular formation. Uh, what happens sometimes uh, during hyaluronic acid uh, degradation, low molecular weight fragments are uh, presented to the more, um, more, um, more to immune system, and that will trigger the inflammation to happen later on. And another issue that may be related to nodular formation is when you introduce the cannula, sometimes you introduce some of the common flora inside, and that may be the need us for the inflammation or the nodular formation to happen. How you treat this, how you treat this one? Sometimes it depends on the cause, and, um, and most of the time we treat it with uh, white days or honey days to dissolve it. And if you get a culture, sometimes it's negative, and most of the time actually is negative. And if they, you suspect infectious cause to be the cause for the nodule formation, it's antibiotics is really recommended. You can add to it also steroid or 5-fluorouracil during the treatment to help the inflammation to be uh, controlled. This is one of the patients, she had the filler injection, in the, and, you, and she presented with the nodules here that she had the filler injection almost a year ago, before presentation, and this is after we dissolve it only with white days and a little bit of steroid, because there was no sign of infection. Filler migration can happen, uh, and that can um, present with as a lump, and most of the time it happens from a distant area, and um, one of the trigger for this one is a patient maybe uh, rubbing the eye or massaging the area that uh, the filler was injected and uh, triggered movement of the filler to uh, another area nearby the eye. Uh, infection and inflammation, this is another uh, issue that we need really to take care to prevent by strict uh, septic technique. And as you know, when you inject, we breach the skin, so I need to make sure that's been cleaned really nicely. Uh, it can be uh, present as acute infection, and this is um, may present with redness and swelling and abscess formation. And also it may present late, meaning two weeks after the injection, as a, a, late, uh, as a late or a chronic infection. Uh, it's really important to differentiate between infection and inflammation, because the treatment strategy will be different. When you suspect infection, you need to take culture from the, if there is a bus or abscess collection, or also uh, from the blood, blood culture uh, if it's possible, if the patient is febrile especially. Uh, how you treat this one? You treat it with antibiotics, systemic antibiotics, and sometimes maybe you inject white days to dissolve the uh, filler because that will be forming as an ADS or as, as a, a source for the infection. And uh, systemic steroid should be avoided in these cases till you get the infection under control. 
This is one of the patients she presented two weeks after being injected elsewhere with the lid swelling and uh, erythema and also hotness. And we treated with oral antibiotics plus dissolving the filler. And this is her result a week after. This is another patient. She had filler injection a year ago, and she presented with the swelling that developed after a few weeks. When you feel it, you, find, you found it fluctuating. That means there's something fluidish behind it or under it. And this is when we, when we drain it. You can see a lot of pus coming, plus some granulation because of delayed or, let's say, delayed nodular formation and uh, infection. So this one was treated with antibiotics along with uh, Y days to, to dissolve the filler. We need to differentiate between infection and inflammation. This patient presented with, uh, with pain and redness in this area, and she had the uh, filler injected around two weeks or three weeks uh, prior. And you can see when you examine, you don't see it hot, but a little bit tender because of inflammation. So for me, it's more of inflammatory process than infectious process. And you know, treating or diagnosing infection in this area is really depend on the clinical sense and the clinical uh, really workup. And we dissolved this filler with uh, Y days and a little bit of steroid, and there, this is her result a week after. So really, Y days dissolved the filler in a few minutes. But sometimes some of it stays longer or it takes time to be uh, dissolved. Another issue that we face, uh, especially when injecting the periorbital area, is malar edema. It's a, it's a chronic, problematic, uh, we see it after uh, hyaluronic acid injection, especially. Um, it's been reported up to 11% of, uh, of patients receiving uh, tear trough treatment with the hyaluronic acid. Uh, and um, as you know, anatomically, the uh, malar uh, symptoms divide the superficial orbicular circuli uh, fat into superficial and deep compartments. So the superficial compartment has a compromised lymphatic drainage. So when you inject the filler in that area, it may compromise the less uh, lymphatic vessels present, and the, uh, present in that area, and that will lead uh, to uh, lymphatic or malar edema. Uh, one of the triggers is excessive uh, volume present and also using a uh, high fiscus area, a uh, high fiscus product that will uh, enhance or trigger the edema, especially if it's injected superficial where the lymphatic vessels is uh, less than the deep area of the uh, uh, periocular area. The swelling may present years after. I have seen it after seven years of filler injection. So if the patient come later, doesn't mean it's not related to filler. With filler degradation uh, and hyaluronic acid breakdown, there will be more hydrophilic uh, particles of the filler, and that will attract more fluid and more edema happening with the time basis. Management with uh, hyaluronic days to dissolve the filler and really effective tool in these patients. Do we need, can we retreat the patient with filler again? Yes, but you need to wait a while, but inject it in a deeper area and with less amount, and you can increase it uh, gradually. This is again just a patient I showed you before, and you can see the fluid here. This is from malar edema because the injection was given a few years ago, actually a few months ago, and you can see when you dissolve, you see the malar edema gone in this area. This is another patient. You can see the malar edema here from filler injection. This is immediately. Um, so one week after the dissolving the filler. Okay, the last one is vascular occlusion. This is one of the bad things, and people talk a lot about it because it's really devastating complication. A patient or somebody coming for a cosmetic procedure end up with a blindness. So that's why they spend a lot talking about precaution, how to prevent it, and what measure need to be taken immediately after uh, the event happened. The, in the incidence of ischemic complication of fillers is estimated to be up to uh, th uh, 3 in 1,000 uh, injection. A preocular area, uh, despite being rich in, in a network of really a good uh, vascular area, it also has some uh, cutaneous vascular compromise. So it's still you can get a necrosis and ischemia in their orbital area. Uh, injection of the gabil, uh, glabilla uh, for treatment of uh, front lines and also for the dorsum of the nose. Uh, 
uh, for what they call it non-surgical rhinoplasty is appear to be the most dangerous area for injection in the fetal and the periorbital area. Uh, the clinical presentation is characterized by severe prolonged uh, pain with blinching followed by lifo reticularis because of the swelling of the tissue uh, because of the uh, ischemia. Late signs that include marked uh, delineation of the necrotic area and formation of small uh, white pustules may happen. Um, the good thing is uh, the blindness is really there. Between 1906 to uh, 2019, uh, there have been uh, 190 cases of blindness from a static injection. And uh, most of these injection was related to fat grafting, not hyaluronic acid. Why is that? Because hyaluronic acid is smaller in particles, so it doesn't affect the ophthalmic artery, but it may go to the branches of ophthalmic artery and block them. And this is why they get blindness after hyaluronic acid injection. Uh, as we talked before, uh, injecting with high pressure and quick, that is a risk factor for uh, having the blood vessels being breached and the filler retrograde going from the, uh, from the area of being injected to the ophthalmic artery then to the central retinal artery. Um, again, using cannula is very helpful or say better precaution or protection against this event to happen. Just talked about it. <clears throat> uh, when, you, when you get a vascular occlusion, uh, hydrodes should be used and should be really flooding the area, you meaning a lot of uh, white days should be injected in the area of ischemia. Uh, till you, you see a perfusion, maybe you need to repeat it three, four times every one hour to one hour, 30 minutes to, to really uh, dissolve the filler and have the, uh, the area uh, re perfused again. Uh, the question comes, what about using uh, Y days or honey days for uh, visual loss? It's still controversial because there is no really good data. There is a rabid, uh, rabid model done by uh, Huang, and they, they evaluated um, using uh, retrobulbar honey days uh, in the animal model after inducing uh, retinal artery occlusion by hyaluronic acid. And they found that uh, the retinal perfusion was uh, assessed by uh, angiography and also by functional ARG. They found the hyaluronic had no effect on perfusion or function in six completely occluded uh, arteries. And in two partially occluded arteries, only one improved uh, retinal perforation, but not the function. So that means that if you go and inject in the uh, periorbit or the retrobulbar, the, the value of uh, Y days or 100 days is questionable. Uh, a case series of ischemic oculomotor uh, palsy and visual loss because of injecting hyaluronic acid, they, removed, um, they reported improvement, but the visual function was not assessed very well to say how much the improvement. A case series of visual loss showed that improvement visual, uh, uh, visual acuity or complete refusal in four cases, but the detail of freely visual assessment wasn't done uh, properly and the retinal occlusion was not documented, or sentinel artery occlusion was not documented properly in these case series. What a reasonable approach for uh, retinal occlusion immediately after uh, filler injection is to hydrate the area where you have the filler injected, like the supratricular and the supraorbital with Y days. Also, it's good to do uh, ocular massage and also rebreathe in the back. That will help to uh, dislodge the, uh, the hyaluronic acid particle that block the, uh, the blood vessels. Uh, as of now, there is uh, no uh, the currency. There is no the, currently there is no uh, really uh, benefit of retrobulbar injection, especially if it's done by somebody who is not expert. If it's done by a dermatologist or other facial, uh, facial plastic surgeon who don't know the anatomy of the orbit, it may induce more harm than really benefit to the patient. This is the only patient I have seen, and hopefully I don't see other patient. This patient had uh, rhinoplasty done five years ago. And she wasn't happy about the depression in the nose here. So, so she had surgery done, which is a risk factor. And the dorsum of the nose is another risk factor. And it was injected with the needle, which is a third risk factor. And this is, she developed the ischemia. You can see the bluish and also around the eye. Luckily, they didn't go in the artery itself. So the ophthalmic artery itself was OK. And the visual function was OK. This is her a week after. The nice thing that the treating physician flood all this area with a lot of white days, so that helped 
uh, reperfusing the area. And this is her uh, picture six weeks after. And luckily, she recovered full function without any compromisation. Uh, with this, we can conclude that uh, with the solid understanding of filler products, appropriate filler materials, and the probable patient selection and accurate injection techniques, physician can expect a satisfied patient uh, with effective volume uh, correction. Most of the time, or actually good amount of time, we need to combine filler injection with another treatment, especially Botox. Sometimes we need to do laser and etc. And this, if you want to read about filler, I recommend starting with these articles. They're really simple and good for a starter to read about and get grasp uh, good information about uh, fillers. And with that, I thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Adel, for the nice presentation and wonderful uh, slides. So we'll open the floor for discussion. Any question? Yes. Thank you, Prof. Adel, for this great presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the infection with fillers. You mentioned that uh, you use wide days to help resolve the infection along with antibiotics. But what I read that it will spread the infection if you use wide days and that better you avoid it. What's your experience on this? Um, but wide days, um, when you use it, you want to dissolve the filler because the filler can be, sometimes it will be uh, forming a shell for the bacteria. So when you dissolve that one, it's good to, uh, for the antibiotics penetration. It may, exactly like if you have a foreign body with, with infection. One of the wise things to do is to remove that foreign body to control the infection. And this is the idea. About what about the surgical, uh, surgical excision or removal of the filler instead? Uh, well, you, of the yeah, what happened with white days, you just inject and dissolve. You don't need to open. And especially if you open the skin in an inflamed area, that will be a great uh, chance for scarring to happen. And especially for a cosmetic patient, if you have a scar in an sighted area, they will not be happy with it. Um, I, this is what I, 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 I didn't see a lot of infection. Maybe I see two or three. And they all they did well. Okay, thank you. For, uh, another thing is for patients with mild infectious or an ophthalmic socket with a deep superior sulcus. Did you give any patients uh, yeah, upper lid filler injection? And how, what's yeah, the results? Yeah, but for me, what I want to inject orbital volume because their problem, the superior sulcus deformity, they have because of volume deficiency, not because of the superior sulcus deficiency. So it's good to inject behind the orbital implant with the thick filler. Try to avoid. Um, Right, uh, radius because the calcium appetite it may go it's been reported to cause cavernous sinus thrombosis so it's good to go with a thick filler I usually use I don't want to mention product but I can talk about it later on but use a thick filler and you go and inject inferior temporal and you with a cannula and build it slowly and you see the improvement that will help the superior sulcus will help the implant to go uh, to be protruded forward and that will help several issues with the same treatment modality okay thank you Yes. Uh, thank you, Prof. Adel, for the nice lecture, as usual. Just my question is from a general ophthalmology point of view. Now, uh, we know that uh, fillers are being used more commonly nowadays. And, um, uh, and we know that is, uh, hyaluronidase is a common component of peribulbar injection. So if we are faced, for example, of uh, a patient who uh, has had filler uh, during the last few months, and he's now for cataract surgery. Do you recommend that we remove this hyaluronidase from the from uh, or uh, Y days from the injection, or or the injection place is deep and it cannot reach the the plane of the filler injection? Can you ask the question again? Now, uh, um, hyaluronidase is a common component of of peribulbar injection. If you are faced with a patient who has has have uh, has have had filler in the in the few months last few months, so injection of peribulbar 
uh, uh, material why days or why days would affect the filler? I think it's far away from it. So sometimes it when you just sometimes if one if you inject filler in one area and the patient is not happy about it, for example, if you inject the tear trap and the latter part of the eye, the, the customer is not happy about, you can inject white days here, and this one will not be changed at all. Because the systemic absorption of white days is not that huge. And even if you, if you give it IV, the half-life of white days is really short. They, 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 they did a study to look for um, retinal occlusion with IV white days, and they found really a short, uh, really a short life for the white days, and also found it not to be effective. But it will not affect, for example, uh, uh, sometimes patients maybe will complain of a failure dissolution after the cataract surgery. It's far away. It's far away. Yeah. Okay. Okay, any more? Yes, Prof. Saleh. Thank you. Uh, to uh, prove that this is a very interesting subject that you have a variety of attendance, retina, glaucoma, pediatrics, and, uh, and I think this is a very hot topic. But now, uh, do you think that the fillers uh, sort of uh, decreases the volume of uh, surgical intervention uh, in the last few years of uh, <coughs> cosmetic blepharoplasty mainly? Well, this is very true. If you go to, like, for example, if you look at the number of fillers done and the number of surgeries done, the fillers, is, I, cannot, I don't have the figure, but it's present. The filler is increasing year by year, and the surgery is decreasing year by year. For example, num number of blepharoplasty done in 2019 is not like the number of blepharoplasty done in 2016. Even That's if definite. You, even if you tell the patient that the fillers mm -hmm. sort of uh, they are temporary, you, you might need to re-inject, and the blepharoplasty, they are more of uh, long term. That's, that's the, what happens, some people, they want to have a quick fix and with no downtime. And also some people, when you tell surgery, they think about complication. And they associated surgery with higher complication to, compared to fair injection. And this, why, this, is, this is a group of people. And other group of people, if you tell them this is, some people, they want to do surgery for something, filler is a better option. And they spend time in the clinic explaining to them, you are not a good candidate for surgery, you're a good candidate for filler. And they say, oh, that's temporary. I said, okay, but this is good for you. Now, uh, for patients, uh, they don't have loss of volume, but they have this black halo under the, uh, in the lower leg. Is filler uh, recommended? Uh, for me, if there is no depression, I don't recommend doing filler, because what happens if you inject filler, the, you, you're really not improving the aesthetic appearance. You are making more lumps in the eyelid, which really doesn't improve. So if there is a depression, yes, but if there is no depression, I don't recommend. What you will do for this case? Uh, you will do wrong. Thank you, Dr. Adel. Um, I have a question. If you see, you can see some patients that coming to you after filler, filler injection, which is done outside, and you don't know what type of filler they had, and sometimes they come with lumps around the uh, preorbital area. So what's your approach? Would you go for Y-Days, steroid? Because you don't know exactly what kind of filler they had. Well, I need to explain to the patient, I don't know. I'm going to hit something. I don't know what is it. And that's why I just mentioned that it's really good for, it's good to be common in public. They know what material they use, and they need to take photo for it. For this one, I explained to the patient, I'm gonna use white days because it's really safe. And we'll start from there. If it's improved with white days, we'll end good. If not improving, I will see you after a week. I inject another time because what happened, some of the filler material is really concentrated and very thick. One injection of uh, white days or 100 days doesn't really dissolve it. So you need to inject maybe twice or three times, especially with the um, <clears throat> product that is not manufactured in a really uh, very good companies because we just I just mentioned that there is a lot of product coming from Asia with really bad quality so we need to inject once or twice if, it, if you see there is no improvement you tell them that okay maybe the surgery is the second option imaging doesn't help much if you do an image MRI and you go you cannot tell you to know what is it a filler for which type and what is it exactly 
So I go with white days and just explain the, to the, the patient. The interval between <coughs> injections, because white days usually gives very fast results. So would you give the second injection after two days, one week? No, I'll give them one week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, visual loss or acute visual loss, how do you diagnose it and how frequent or, or sorry, how uh, uh, rapid it happens? Do you check the vision after the injection or? Uh, uh, the patient discovered by chance, for example, central, central retinal artery occlusion, he might not notice that. Yeah, what happened with visual loss, there's some other things. They will have pain, a, a sharp pain, and they, immediately the patient discovered Why this. have sharp pain? Uh, because of the, 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 the itself, the, the report, because of the ischemia, there was some pain with it. Because small, the, a small uh, molecule or small amount went to the central heart occlusion, he will not have pain. Yeah, most of the people reported the, 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 uh, the visual loss reported with necrosis around the eyelid and other area. If you talk about branch retinal artery occlusion, yes, you cannot discover this. And do you uh, correct both sides if he if did it at the same time? Or? Yeah, we do it always bilateral. Same time? Yeah. I see. Okay, thank you. We do blepharoplasty bilateral. Everything we do it bilateral. It's better for the recovery and better no, for no, blepharoplasty. I'm talking because I'm I'm worried about the acute visual loss like this one by injection. Like blepharoplasty, there's no risk. Of, no, there, uh, there is a hematoma risk. Hematoma, retinal yeah, bulbar. So. Hematoma, but you can see it. You can see the bleeding. Or if it happened, it happened with the, Omar, one surgeon did something for him, and hematoma <laughs> happened to him. Huh? But not retinal bulbar. <laughs> No, but what I'm, what I'm saying is sometimes we talk about something that is really rare. So, for example, if you see the retrobulbar hematoma or hemorrhage after blepharoplasty, it's way more common than visual loss. And also, if you compare the number of injections, the number of injections keep giving really a lot compared to blepharoplasty. So, if, I mentioned just in, in, in almost in 100 years, around 200 cases reported only, with the number of fillers exceeding maybe millions of millions, that is not, but sometimes when you, when you present something, even if it's a one in a million, you need to mention about it, and you need to take a precaution for it. Okay, right there. Dr. Adel, thank you very much. Um, any precautions you ask your patient to avoid uh, uh, after the injection? Because we we hear about different like advices not to take shower and maybe it's good maybe to mention it. Uh, to well, the, well, the same thing applies for Botox. If you if you inject Botox, then people they give you really interesting advices given by another physician. When you search for evidence, there is no evidence. Uh, what I recommend people, I used to ice pack it, but I stopped doing it because what happened if I ice pack it? Some people they press hard on it, so it will move the filler from the area that you intended to. Um, just rubbing, that's really another thing. Um, otherwise, I don't recommend. Injection, for example, in other areas has another precaution. For example, injection in the lips, they have another precaution. But around the eyes, just not to sleep in that area if injected in the malar area, and not to rub the eye. Um, half exercise, I don't recommend them the same day or a second day. A third day, they can go for half exercise. Shower, I don't think it's playing a role. And, and for how long do you think why this can happen after the, uh, can can work after the injection? So sometimes we see patients injected like uh, a month or two or two months back, and they come with a lump or migration. Um, for from your reading or your experience, what's the time frame? For I use it for patients who had the injection seven years after, and it's gone. Okay. Yeah. So it even works it, even after the many years. long time yeah. left of the injection. Okay, thank you, Prof. Adel. Thank you so much for your patience, and good luck. Do you want to take the quiz now, or you want a break? Absolutely. Adel, when rest, when the legs rest, rain works. So let them rest. When do you want us to meet, then? After 50 weeks? Because I'm going to take the quiz now, so... في أحد شيف ريزيدنت يتكلم عشان نسمع له ولا مالك منترس في الكويز أصلاً عبد الله تبغون الكويز الحين حمود الحين أي تبغون الكويز الحين طيب توكل على الله
لا 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 حطي انا ترى كبيره مره حجمها كم حجمها؟ ما اعرف بس مره طول يعني اه 270 ميجا اي ثينك ات ويس ورك على طول جست بلج ات وين اتس يور تايم اوكي جاهزين شباب المنطقة هنا شكلها فيها مشكلة ها ملغمة طيب um, can we dim the lights please it will be uh, simple, question, simple questions with easy quiz inshallah so this is the first uh, patient. This is a six-month-old baby with uh, four months history of swelling and popping the right eye. What the treatment you like to start with this, with for this patient, and what syndrome do you need to rule out in large segmental lesion of similar nature?
اللي يجلس بالصف الاول له بونص ها لا في دكتوره هنا Okay, this is a 40-year-old female with left lower lid swelling for three months duration. She had history of filler injection in the face for volume augmentation three years ago. Give me three differential diagnoses. Okay, this is a 40-year-old male with uh, thyroid eye disease, came with the diplopia started three uh, weeks ago. What treatment do you like to start with, uh, what treatment do you like to start with which has a long-term effect? Uh, this is a three-year-old girl with uh, severe left uh, upper lid uh, congenital ptosis. Uh, give one clinical observation to help you to decide doing unilateral frontal sling versus bilateral frontal sling. Mm, this is a 55-year-old male, came with a complaint of bilateral swelling below the lower eyelids. What do you, what's your likely diagnosis, and what clinical finding help you to make this uh, diagnosis? So this is a way he, when he looks straight and when he look up. حضرت Grand Round ولا ما حضرته؟ No, he, no filler injection. <laughs> so he has no filler injection.
Okay, are we done? Not the answer, but I want to tell you what I gave up. الأسئلة مرة قصيرة ما فيها هو على قولتهم يا تعرف يا ما تعرف تبغون نجمع الأوراق شباب بس عشان نبدأ كرسات نصلي على ما نخلص دكتورة ممكن واحدة منكم يتكرم جاه مشكورا يجمع الأوراق وليد خبير انت عاد بنسال كل الاسئله الكوز حق الاسبوع الجاي بيجي اليوم كيف مورك؟ يعطيك العافية. شكرا لك دارا. لا حد يطلع لان بعشوائيا انا بختار من من الاوراق وبسال اللي اخترت ورقته. فاللي بيطلع معناته اجابته مو بصحيحه بنشيل بنشيل اسمه. لا حد يطلع اللي يطلع ترى بنلغي درجته لان بسال من من الاوراق. شوف اللي استعان بصديق ولا كان مجهود لوحده. سليمان الله يعظم اجرك، ما في ولا واحد منهم قام يساعدك، الله يهديكم بس. ونقول الحل ورقة لها ساعة محظوظة ولا الغير محظوظة؟
جسر جسر ثابت او ياسر ياسر وينك ياسر اوكي ياسر تكرم علينا باول واحد شكرا اوكي ذاتس فيري جود اه بس ايش لا يبغى لك استعانه بصديقي ياسر انا اشوف الصديق اسمه خالد ادى ايش اسمه خالد الديحان ها خالد ايش رايك لا يبغى واحد ثاني غير خالد اجا وليد ما يعني انت يا وليد فيس سندروم فيس سندروم لايك وات That's very good. من شاف محمد العتيبي أنا دورة من زمان. يلا محمد جاوب لنا هذه. ها؟ كان بي تشيليزن ذاتس جود يو مين ماجريتد فيلر اوكي ماجريتد فيلر سكند يا وات ام تراينج تو ساي ذيس از ا بيناين ليجن اوكي Benign lesion, you think about, can be infectious process, inflammatory process, um, benign lesion, for hemangioma, and anything. Just think about this way, okay? If you have a lesion that's been there for three months, this is more of benign lesion, especially if it's not inflamed. So it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not acute infection. It can be a chronic infection, for example, tuberculosis. It can be inflammatory nodules like sarcoidosis. And etc. And this line, think about, and it will come with a reasonable differential diagnosis. But I agree with you, Chalazian, uh, migrated filler, it can be sarcoidosis in a dual, it can be cavernous hemangioma, etc. Migrated filler. That's a bare minute filler, okay? سليمان اسالك كل مساك طلعت ورقتك ايش رايك شوف السؤال جاوبه ولا اتس اب تو يو هذه اوكي انا جبت السؤال عشان شيء ثاني وش هو لا ويتس ا لونج تيرم افكت دبل فيجن اكتيف ثايرويد ديزيز Radiation therapy. Okay, I want you to mention radiation therapy because steroid doesn't give long term. So what's the treatment here? You you give steroid with radiation therapy, and this is what's been proven a really good indication for uh, radiation therapies. You have a recent uh, onset of double fission. They found it most effective in this subset of patients. Sam. Uh, compression is not for double fission. You're not treating double fission with. And you remember when we do decompression, we do it only for an acute stage. We do it for compressive optic neuropathy full stop. We don't do it for something else. You agree? Huh? Yeah, but this is three weeks. So how much of the so on? Yeah, that's good, but when you give a quiz, you want to have a solid evidence, okay? Now with the other tips and other things that's going on, maybe we change the quiz after five years after getting a solid evidence. So what you see is just initial, uh, say initial uh, clinical experience with it, but it's not a solid like radiation therapy. Or with tips and other things, may, may, things may change, so we'll wait and see.
Abdullah Al Bilali Abdullah Alimna Malamak Allah لا uh, this is we agreed سفير توسط صح يعني no question that the fatal function is poor صح ولا لا you agree with me okay with the طب خلينا نروح يعني عندنا فير سير صح لا لا المفروض ما نسألك السؤال هذا خلينا نسأل فير دير من هنا فير دير راكان وينك يا راكان قرناس راكان جرينيس مو موجود هذا غايب احنا ما قلنا له حد يطلع المفروض يستاذن ادبا يعني طيب خلينا نسال هذا الورقه عبد الرحمن الجاسر يفتينا That's very good. Using eyebrow indicating that she wants to use her eye, okay? If she's not using eyebrow that means she's not interested. And you know, the most important really success for this surgery is the patient to use brow. If they're not using their brow, no point doing the uh, frontal suspension. Because you're suspending it to use the brow. If they're not using the brow, no point. What other track? Yeah, chin up. If they're doing chin up, that means they're interested to use that eye. If they're not interested, they will not use that eye. If you don't see these things, I don't recommend doing frontalis flab or frontalis sling in general for unilateral. I recommend bilateral. If you want them to use that eye, if you don't want them to use that eye, don't you do it. You will do, you'll do it, but the patient will not benefit from it. Sam. غالبا this one that's good for acquired tosses but for congenital severe unilateral we don't do this why I'm, I'm stressing in this one because I want to know if the patient is going to use uh, eye brow after surgery or not this is the indication How did the chin up if you look? This patient, you see, he's not interested. You see the, the one in the right, in the left. He's not interested to use his brow. Also, he has a severe tosses. So if you do frontalis sling in this patient, it's no point. Well, you see this one, the other child is doing chin up. This is, that means he's interested in. هذه نبغى لها female عاد. تتبرع واحدة ولا نختار؟ يارا 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 ايش؟ ها؟ بلوي وش رايك يا يارا؟ ممكن ترفعين صوتك بس اذا تكرمين؟ كان وي جيت انذر انسر؟ استعانة بصديق ولا استعانة بإيمان؟ So what do you think? Something we talked about, but not for this patient. Huh? No, no. So he came because of the swelling here. Do you see the swelling? Do you see the swelling here? No filler. Huh? Malar edema, yeah, or fistons. How you differentiate between the two? Ask the patient to look up. If they look up in the same amount, you see the swelling here and the swelling here. Is it different or the same? The same. That means this is not a fat prolapse, okay? Fat prolapse, when they look up, it will prolapse more. And when they look down, it will sink inside, huh? But this is malar edema or fistons, okay? If it's inject if filler injecting, this may be related to the filler. Clear? Take my life, Jimmy. The one in Sully will end up case presentation. We can Sully Ahsan. Okay, I'm going to ask you to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. I love you.